Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the Helion International Conference and for the nice introduction. So, today I will analyze the science fiction novel The Watch by Dennis Danvers, and in it, the protagonist asks himself whether it is ethically permissible to use a certain science fiction gadget to achieve a good goal. To elaborate and answer this question, I proceed in these six steps. First, I outline the general problem of science fiction gadgets as a source of unfair success. Second, I very briefly introduce the author of the novel. Third, I go into the novel itself, which I'm sure some people haven't heard of. Fourth, I discuss a surprising twist in the novel, in a sense spoiling it, so spoiler warning ahead again. And this twist looks like a break between fiction and reality. Fifth, I then show that the twist in the novel is quite consistent with its basis, namely the handed down beliefs of the real anarchist Peter Kropotkin. And sixth, I conclude by claiming that the novel's ambition goes beyond fiction precisely because of the surprising twist. The novel turns out to be a call for real-world revolution at the end. But let's start with the gadgets. By gadgets I mean small technical objects that have functionalities that do not yet exist in contemporary reality, and which often even ensure that a story that would otherwise have to be assigned to the adventure, agent or thriller genre becomes science fiction. The first thing I always think of when I hear the word gadget is Inspector Gadget, who carries gadgets all over his body and in his clothes to help him hunt down the bad guys. He can telescope his legs or use a robot, a rotor built into his head to gain height. In his shoes are wheels, skis and rockets to move faster, and so on. Without these things, he wouldn't stand a chance against his nemesis, Dr. Claw. The gadgets make, his, uh, make this animated series science fiction, albeit on a very simple level. According to Farrah Mendelssohn's Poetics of Fantasy, such gadgets make a text an instance of intrusion fantasy. The rules of the world change because of them, of these uh, gadgets, but only limited to the use of the gadgets and their effect. This limitedness creates an uneven playing field and allows the hero to overcome obstacles without really having to be smarter or stronger than the opponents. Pictured here, I have a gadget from the comic Transmetropolitan. It is a bowel disruptor, as used by the Gonzo journalist Spider Jerusalem, to terrorize some opponents. He can use it to force instant bad diarrhea on them, yes, you heard right, which gives him an advantage in the spectacles world he, life, he lives in. Many science fiction stories work precisely because their heroes have a technical advantage like this, although not necessarily so, so nasty. But it can also make them boring. That's why Ursula K. Le Guin dispensed with such gadgets after her first novels in the Heinish universe, which, for example, featured impenetrable protective suits that made the protagonists practically invincible. Vulnerable heroes are more realistic, the stories become more exciting, and they become, in a sense, fairer, at least if you apply a sports ethic that condemns the use of certain technologies even in sports that are mainly material battles these days, think Formula One racing. Unless they are available to all participants, of course. So, it is possible that an ethical problem arises in the use of such gadgets. But this only becomes relevant if science fiction is not simply entertainment, but 
possibly has an extra literary, ethical or political claim itself. And this brings me to my example. It's a novel written by Dennis Danvers. Danvers is not related to Captain Marvel, that is Carol Danvers, and as far as I know, he has no superpowers. He was born in 1947 and works full-time as a fantasy and science fiction writer. He has published eight novels as well as numerous short stories that have appeared in typical magazines or online. He lives in the southern states of the USA, in Richmond, Virginia, where he also teaches literature at the local university, especially science fiction and fantasy. His novels are often about love under fantastic conditions, but he also attaches importance to social and political themes, which he works on from the political left. He carries out the latter convincingly in his novel The Watch. This novel, which, as we shall see later, has an additional very long subtitle, was first published in 2002. I read it in the 2003 paperback edition. Only two years ago it was published as an e-book. Three years ago, sorry. The book is one of eight selected by the New York Times in 2002 as a notable book of the year in the science fiction category, alongside, for example, John Clute's Appleseed, Robert Silverberg's The Longest Way Home, Nalo Hopkinson's Skin Fog, and Kim Stanley Robinson's The Years of Rise and Salt. In a blurb, Publishers Weekly claims the novel will become a minor classic in the field. I don't think that happened, though, but the novel deserved it, I think. The Watch is a time travel novel, with the titular watch being the time machine. It is a typical science fiction gadget used in an otherwise normal world. It has fantastic effects, first on the protagonist, later on many other people, potentially even on the whole world. Therefore, according to Mendelssohn, the novel can be categorized as intrusive fantasy. With the time machine, however, the protagonist can not only transport himself and other people to other times in the, same sp in the same place. Apparently, even death can be overcome with it. Leaving aside a number of historical quotations, the first three words of the novel are Since my death. They are spoken by Peter Kropotkin, who in reality had lived from 1842 to 1921. He had been born into a high noble family, but soon rejected Tsardom. He became a scientist and eventually an anarchist revolutionary and theorist. Numerous articles and books by him have survived, which also deal with ethical and political issues as well as a biography. Dennis Danvers has obviously studied these sources thoroughly for he resurrects a credible Kropotkin, albeit rejuvenated to 32 years old and transported 78 years into the future. Kropotkin is aware of this fantastic situation. Quote, I have been raised from my deathbed and given a new life by a strange benefactor from the future named Anchi Mahur. I am resurrected full-grown like a character in a novel." End quote. But the narrative style of Kropotkin, who appears as a first-person narrator, clearly resembles that of his autobiography, which was already originally written in English. Specialists on Kropotkin's literature will therefore recognize him, even intradiegetically this is noticeable at some point. Yet the old young anarchist ends up not in his homeland, but in Richmond, Virginia, that is Dennis Denver's hometown. The culture shock is relatively mild. 
films are cut too quickly for him and there is too little cocaine in the Coca-Cola, but overall Kropotkin finds his way around. The political and economic situation, however, leads him to become politically active again on a small scale after only a few days. For example, he convinces his co-workers in the snack bar where he works as a dishwasher to collect leftover food and distribute it to the poor. Kropotkin himself is initially homeless. Soon he moves into a house that is subculturally strongly reminiscent of the squatter scene, even though it is not actually squatted. Kropotkin networks with people interested in anarchism and direct action to bring more freedom and justice. Eventually, the situation escalates. Obviously, an anarchist revolution breaks out, of which Kropotkin is the symbol. In the process, the anarchist only uses the clock after some time, the functioning of which remains mysterious. In one situation, Kropotkin and two of his friends are held by a policeman at the foot of the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. With the watch, they can escape into the past, but have to return to the present where the policeman is waiting for them. So they agree on how to overpower him when they return. No sooner said than done, the policeman has no chance and is beaten up. To some extent, Kropotkin uses classical anarchist propaganda methods of direct action, such as changing social situations by mutual aid, but also speeches to interested audiences. But during the time he lives homeless, by the river, he notices other homeless people who are, I don't know, somehow crazy. He finds out that they are locals, but not contemporaries. Confused people emerge from two past times in Richmond. From the time of slavery come plantation slaves, and from the time of the Civil War come prison inmates. They have only one thing in common, hatred of authoritarianism. And they have nothing to lose, because they experienced misery and suffering in their time of origin, perhaps they were even on the verge of death. But now, in 1999, they sense the chance to overthrow the system of exploitation and oppression in a militant mass revolution. It is true that this is now a different system than in the 19th century, but from Kropotkin, who, as in his first life, reads a great deal and engages in social criticism, they learn that exploitation and oppression still exists, albeit in a new form. Moreover, it is obvious that the old times of slavery are still glorified by the official side and parts of the population. After all, that is what the statue of the Southern General stands for. Of course, for the mass-based revolution, one would also have to have a mass. The Americans of 1999 can perhaps be swept along, but the initiative must come from the harder exploited of earlier centuries. Kropotkin recognizes this and finally brings them to the end of the 20th century with his clock, that is, with a time machine. In the novel, a revolution begins that eventually seems unstoppable. I am sure that Danvers does not set his novel in his hometown out of local patriotism, but also because strong conservative reactionary forces are at work here, and it is particularly fascinating to see their rule totter and fall. That must have seemed particularly unlikely 20 years ago when Danvers wrote the novel. In fact, however, the statue, which was understood by supporters and opponents alike to symbolize the lost cause of the South, that is, white supremacy and the trivialization of slavery, has since disappeared. Yeah, in the meantime, the statue has disappeared. Um, 
it was removed less than a year ago. Before that, it had become one of the focal points of protests against racism and police violence. Protests can achieve something even in Richmond. Not much, though. Kropotkin would probably have been pleased or happy to see the statue gone, but ultimately it is just a symbol and it was removed by the governor because of a political decision and a court ruling. It would have been more anarchistic if the protesters had toppled it directly on their own strength and on their will to decide, as has happened to many other racist statues. This question of whether political change comes from above or from below is quite central to anarchism, to Kropotkin's thinking and to the novel. In the novel, the anarchist revolution seems to have broken out inexorably. Kropotkin, however, finds this suspicious. In particular, he is suspicious of the role of Anchi Mahur, from whom he got the time-traveling clock. He finds out that he is only a pawn in a larger game that he does not understand. The revolutionaries, and especially he, are manipulated disposal masses of superior, superior beings from the future, and the revolution serves their purposes, which are unknown in the year 1999. Kropotkin, therefore, turns against Anchi Mahur, gives up the clock, and in doing so, in a sense, cancels the revolution. Without the clock, there are no 19th century time travelers and thus no revolutionaries. The revolution virtually vanishes into thin air. For the reader, this is shocking and disappointing. Why does the revolutionary Kropotkin abandon the revolution? Well, the answer is found in the writings of the real Kropotkin who died in 1921. At least in part. The aborted revolution was not an anarchist one, it was not a self-liberation of the people or the oppressed. It contradicted Kropotkin's ethical convictions. Now the fact is that Kropotkin actually wrote a book on ethics. It is his last book. In fact, he died while writing it, so it is not complete at all. In the book, he goes through the whole history of philosophy and charges a, charges a large number of philosophical positions concerning ethics according to his criteria. Ethics that are authoritarian and derive from authorities, especially from God, he considers wrong. Only ethics that come from below, so to speak, and trust human beings to act ethically themselves, even without orders and threats of punishment from above, are ethical in the proper sense. This can also be applied to the fictional situation in the novel. Anchi Mahur is something like an overpowering future god who must be obeyed in order to be able to do the right thing namely to overthrow the rulers. Thus, unfortunately, the right thing stops being the right thing and not every domination is overthrown in the process. Anchi Mahur remains in the saddle. Alas, the second half of Kropotkin's ethics book is missing. He didn't finish it in fiction either. Therefore, I have to speculate a bit. What is certain is that something that has, to, has come to be called prefiguration is important in Kropotkin's work, that is, the conviction that ends and means must coincide. Authority cannot be defeated by authoritarian methods. It is not only Anchi Mahur's authority that must be rejected. The unilateral superiority that Kropotkin has because of the science fiction gadget, the time traveling clock, also prevents equality of power between the revolutionaries. 
because uh, for with the clock, Kropotkin could at any time bring in other revolutionaries from the past who would be his followers, making him something like Lenin. And Lenin was exactly the opposite of what Kropotkin imagined a good revolutionary to be. In reality, he met him and scolded him harshly. So, for ethical reasons, the revolution is cancelled in the novel. But don't get me or Kropotkin or Danvers wrong. It would be perfectly ethical to start an anarchist revolution and win. In a final plot twist, the novel's status as fiction is reversed. Kropotkin now claims that everything narrated is true and that he is really in prison where he was put after the failure of the revolution. And the novel was his account of his experiences, which he had written down and given to Anchi Mahur, so that he could spread the story. Mahur replies, quote, There's a fellow here in town who might do it, pass it off as his work. But he's a science fiction writer, no one would take it seriously. End quote. Of course, Dennis Danvers himself is that writer, and hence the full title of the novel is, now I quote, The Watch, being an, the unauthorized sequel to Peter A. Kropotkin's Memoirs of a Revolutionist, as imparted to Dennis Danvers by Anchi Mahur, Traveler from a Distant Future, or a science fiction novel. The novel ends with Kropotkin in prison, but the anarchist does not necessarily have to stay there. He addresses his last words to the disappointed readers who would rather have seen him free and successful. Quote, Strike out in any direction. You'll find prisons and prisoners everywhere you turn. If you want to set me free, set all us jailbirds free. End quote. So in the end, the novel is no longer a novel at all, but a call for the abolition of prisons and for an anarchist revolution. And it is precisely because of Kropotkin's ethical scruples that the revolution must be transferred from fiction to reality. But, of course, we do not have time machines. We do not have to fear to become unfair because of such very unlikely gadgets. We can be unfair in a million other ways, but. We do not have to. Yeah, and that's all I have to say about this book. Thanks for listening to me.